No one can get away from God. That's the truth that we'll hear today on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to come aboard the Bible bus as we come to Daniel chapter 4, beginning at verse 10, where Dr. McGee tells us how even the most secret sins of believers on earth are open scandal in heaven. As you find your seat and you open your Bible, we have Greg Harris. Hey, Steve. And he's here with us again today. This time, we have a few local letters that we want to share with you. And, you know, as we've said before, we never get tired of hearing how God is working in places that, well, most of us will never get to go to except on our knees. But today, <laughs> let's hear from people who really could be our neighbors. That's right. And we're going to start with David from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And you and I have been there. We've been there together, yep. actually, for the ministry. And he writes this, For the last year or so, I have been greatly tortured by Satan and his workers, physically, mentally, and spiritually. I thought God was angry at me and had turned his back on me. I was greatly discouraged. Then last night, I heard a message from Dr. McGee about suffering, and this took so much weight off of me. Hmm. Now I realize God has not forsaken me. He is not mad at me, and that it is normal for a Christian to suffer. Thank you so much for continuing to air Dr. McGee's messages. They are a great blessing to me and my wife. We listen to his programs over the Internet. Keep up the good work. We will continue to send financial support as we are able. Wow. That is an encouragement. Thank you, David, for that. Here's a letter. This one's from Sandra in Indio, California. Each time I go through the Bible with our beloved Dr. McGee, I use a new Bible. I write Dr. McGee's comments and insights on the pages as I study, and when the journey is finished, I give the Bible to one of my children or grandchildren. Two and a half done, only three and a half to go, LOL. <laughs> and she's a grandma right now, LOL. I'm That's impressed. Right. That LOL is because I'm already 76 years old. I'm sure these Bibles will be passed into future generations, and they too will be blessed by Dr. McGee. Just as an aside, our chairman, Leo Carlin, yes. does the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, he does. These studies have made me look longer at our God and love deeper. Thank you for that. I also want to thank you for taking me around the world on my knees. Way to go. And I now pray for countries that I would never have given a second thought to. When I see a person in the street from another culture, I wonder, have I prayed for your country? Can't wait to meet Dr. McGee in heaven. May God bless all of you. Mm, that's so powerful. What a great idea, too. I hope some of our listeners will pick that up and start doing that with their own family. Yeah. Wonderful idea. This next letter is from Olive in British Columbia, Canada. I am on my second five-year journey. The first was a bit sporadic at times. The second journey is better. That's, oh, that's good, good encouragement for our new listeners. <laughs> I've become more passionate about understanding the scriptures and learning how to relate to God through his holy word. I am bedridden mostly, so I do not go to church or meet with any Christians. I am so thankful for Through the Bible. I try to get others to listen to the programs, but most of my family are not interested. I have a sister who listens regularly, and two of my children listen sometimes. It is the only program I have found that teaches the whole Bible in a consistent, easy-to-understand way. I wish all Christians would listen regularly. We feel the same way, Olive. Yep. As so many are like I used to be. They are familiar with Scripture, and they think it is boring. It isn't until you see all of Scripture as a whole and hear it regularly that you begin to love it and hunger for it. Thank you for your faithful witness to a lost world and to hungry Christians all over the world. And thank you for that letter, all of it. It means a lot to us. And if you haven't yet written to us and you enjoy listening to the broadcast and you've gotten something particularly out of the study um, where God's Word is more real to you, we would certainly appreciate you writing and giving us that testimony. You can write to BibleBus at ttb.org if you do the email thing, or you can always do the U.S. mail, Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, including British Columbia, you can write to Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C6B1. And Greg, why don't you pray for our listeners as we begin our study in Daniel. Heavenly Father, we are amazed at how powerful you are and how powerful your word is. We will continue as you enable us to hold it out to everyone in the world and pray that you will use it to change people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come back to this very remarkable fourth chapter of Daniel. 
in every one of the chapters in Daniel is remarkable, and that's the reason that we've slowed down to a walk. And this chapter here tells us of another dream of Nebuchadnezzar. It's about a great tree that was hewn down to a stump, and it was fulfilled in the subsequent period of the king's madness. And we saw last time the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar, which actually he made after the experience that's recorded here in this fourth chapter. And we also were considering the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And I'm going to put in today here at the 11th verse, probably I should gather it up again and begin reading here at verse 10, because the vision now that he had, he tells us. Verse 10 of the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. Now, I break off the reading that verse 16. These verses contain the substance of the dream which centers about the tree. Now the tree grew tall to heaven and wide enough to fill the earth. Now the tree evidently was an evergreen, for its leaves were fair. It was a fruit tree, for the fruit was eaten by all. It fed the earth. Beasts stood in the shadow, and birds rested in its branches. And a tree in Scripture can represent a man. You remember in Psalm 1, 3, speaking of the blessed man, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And then a tree can represent a nation, as it does in Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, and Isaiah 56. We've already seen this. And Ezekiel 31. And the mustard tree in Matthew 13, 31 and 32 represents Christendom today. And the olive tree represents both Israel and the Gentiles. And you'll find that over in the 11th chapter of Romans, verses 16 through 24. But I'm not going to turn to them because I think it's quite evident, and we've been over all this ground before, that the tree can represent a man, it can represent a nation, and it represents Christendom, it represents all of the Gentiles, it can represent Israel. So that the tree here represents Nebuchadnezzar primarily, and his kingdom of Babylon. The king and kingdom were inseparable. And the watcher and the holy one, they are an order of created intelligences that God has. The watchers are the holy ones who administer the affairs of this world. 
Maybe you didn't know that, but the book of Daniel is going to make it very clear that God has created intelligences that administer his universe. And this world that you and I live in, God has an administrator. And under him, there'll be many created intelligences. And over against that, why you find that Satan has his minions that also have charge of certain areas of the earth, certain nations. We're going to see that in the book of Daniel later on. I merely allude to it now. Now, these watchers, they see all, they hear all, and they tell all. You see, the very interesting thing is that many believers today think that they are living in secret, that they're not under the eye of God. But you and I, we talk about we want to enjoy our privacy. My friend, you and I haven't any privacy, if you really want to know the truth. We're told in Psalm 139, you couldn't get away from God. Wouldn't make any difference where you went. We're told that secret sin on earth is open scandal up yonder in heaven. They know all about you, friend. And if you're a Christian, got secret sin in your life, you better go to the Lord and get it straightened out because it's common gossip up in heaven. And so here, why these watchers are watching over it. Now the tree was hewn down and a band of iron and brass was put around the stump They indicate it would grow and flourish again in seven years. And the heart of the ruler or the tree was to be changed into that of a beast. The vegetable was to become an animal in this dream here. And we have another dream that most men labor on today. They call it evolution, that a man started out as a little wiggle tail. In fact, now they think he's seaweed. And he started off like that. Vegetable became an animal. But of course, that happens every day. It's quite interesting. The cow or the sheep goes out and eats the grass. That grass is turned into meat. And you and I put it on the table. That is one we can afford to buy. Now, verses 17 and 18. And I'm reading now, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth over it the basis of man. Three things here that are the explanation of why God gave this to us. We ought to get the message. The first one is this that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man. Now, if you feel that God has abdicated today and withdrawn from this universe, you are wrong. It's not loose from him. Emerson was wrong when he said, things are in the saddle and they ride mankind. There happens to be somebody else in the saddle, and he's in control of this earth. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That's in the second Psalm. God says that he's going on with his purpose in the world. Now, he's permitting Satan for a very definite reason to carry out a nefarious plot. Now, God is demonstrating something to his created intelligences today. And there are a lot of silly things being said about Satan today that are entirely unscriptural. We're going to get to that later on, too. Now, will you notice, I want to read here at verse 18 of chapter 4 of Daniel. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, now that's Daniel, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Now, you see, this was done for threefold reason, and I've only mentioned one of them. First, the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man. Nations rise and fall to teach men that God rules and overrules the kingdom of this world. And if you think that this nation you and I live happens to be his special little pet 
today, you're entirely wrong. We've already, I think, been put on the auction block and we're judged. And my friend, this entire splurge that we're taking, this downward course that we're on today, is going to take us to the judgment of God. He ruleth in the kingdom of man, friends. That's something we need to know today. Now, the second is this, and he giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now, you probably thought that the Democrats put their man in power, and you probably thought the Republicans did. <laughs> well, they think they do, but God disposes of these kingdoms according to his will. And that may cause some chest to puff up, and they say, well, then I'm occupying this office by the will of God. A lot of kings in the past got that foolish notion also, that they were ruling in God's place. Don't believe a word of it. God puts them in power. And the third statement may be a little upsetting. But notice, Paul says in Romans 13, 1, the powers that be are ordained of God. Now, why in the world does God permit certain powers to rule on this earth? Why does he permit it? Well, the third statement is rather humbling to mankind, and it ought to be humbling to both the Democrats and Republicans and everybody else in this country, as well as everywhere. And he setteth up over it the basest of men. Now, you think that we pick the best man. We don't. God says he puts over it the basis of man. And you can take that for what it's worth, friends. It's in the word of God. God's not going to withdraw that. And all you have to do is to read human history. I have been reading, as I've indicated, English history. And I've really been enjoying it. And I want to tell you this, that our ancestors came off those little islands called the British Isles. You know, we have some bloody ancestors. My, they were terrible. And I give you my word, they had some rulers there that were unspeakable. My, and the Battle of the Roses, that sounds so romantic. Oh, that was an orgy. That was a blood orgy. That was horrible. God set it up over it, the basis of man, and we get the kind of a ruler that we deserve. People complain about our government and our Congress and all that sort of thing. My friend, you put them up there. You voted for them. And God lets the basis of man come to power. That ought to be humbling for Washington. I like to see some of these men who are trying to curry favor with the great man of the world when they get a chance to speak at the presidential breakfast or be invited to speak in Washington they take this 17th verse as a text. He setteth over it the basis of man. And you can see now why they never invite me up there, friend, because you see, I think it'd be a little upsetting to speak on this subject up there. Now, will you notice, history will substantiate this statement. And if you're honest and want to look at history, the head of gold was insane. That's going to be Nebuchadnezzar. He suffered from a form of insanity, yet a brilliant, brilliant ruler. He formed the first great world kingdom, first great world ruler. And he had times when he was as mad as a mad hatter, and he didn't even know who he was. Now, Alexander the Great was an alcoholic. Hitler was abnormal. Neither Mussolini nor Stalin would qualify as normal individuals. And the forefathers of our nation did not establish it as a kingdom because they believed that no man could be trusted to rule. And that is true. God's demonstrating it now over a period of time. He says, I set over it the basis of man. And you can believe that because God says it. Now Daniel's going to interpret the dream. Verse 19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, 
My Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Now, actually, this to Daniel was a great shock and blow. Although he might have suspected something, but certainly now that Nebuchadnezzar is his friend and he is the prime minister, the first dream that Nebuchadnezzar had had, it dignified him. But this dream debases him. And it's so bad that Daniel is reluctant to reveal it to the king. And Daniel resists whatever temptation there may have been to withhold from Nebuchadnezzar the full story, for he now gives the entire count to the king. And by the way, that raises the question, should doctors give to their patients the truth in case of a fatal disease? Well, Daniel told all. And I believe that a doctor ought to tell his patient, I don't care who he is or what the circumstances are, what it is. If a man's getting ready to make the biggest step of his life, he ought to know it. That is, if somebody else knows it, the information should be given to him. Unfortunately, a great many people like for a doctor, you know, to more or less butter them up, make them feel good. And a great many people probably need a little psychological treatment. A doctor, a friend of mine told me, he says, I've given out more sugar pills than any other kind of pills. He had a clientele of rich women. And he said, about all they need is just be encouraged a little that they're well. And they are sick, but only in their head, of course. May I say to you, friend, Daniel's going to lay it on the line. Now, he does use a great deal of tact, I think, in approaching the problem. He tells Nebuchadnezzar at first that the good in the dream is for the enemies of the king. Now, verse 20 of the fourth chapter of Daniel, and I'm reading. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Now the tree represents Nebuchadnezzar. He has grown strong. He's become great and he's a world ruler, and he's filled the then civilized world. And his dominion here, and Nebuchadnezzar personally, that is the picture that is before us. Now, we're going to have to wait till next time to see the terrible thing that's going to happen to this man, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we believe that this section here is very important. It's very important today to understand what's happening in this world in which we live. And a Christian should be well versed in this. I'm afraid a great many people spend so much time wanting to know about that image of Nebuchadnezzar, and we have so much sensationalism and prophecy. But what about this tree? Not much time is spent with it. We'll spend a little more time next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Nebuchadnezzar certainly had some amazing dreams. As Dr. McGee mentioned, we'll take a look at the image of the tree next week. If you'd like to prepare for our studies, I encourage you to read the remainder of chapter 4 and then continue on through chapter 7 to get ready for the rest of the week. And if you haven't ordered Dr. McGee's notes and outlines, they're available on our website for free. Just visit us at ttb.org forward slash briefing the Bible. That's all one word to download them in one volume today or to receive an abridged paperback copy by mail. Call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or write to box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109 or in Canada, box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. And if you're interested in learning more about prophecy, you'll find many excellent booklets and books by Dr. McGee available at ttb.org as well. Just click on the resources section and select free booklets. A few more you might be interested in are Darkness and Light, The Day of the Lord, The Millennium, and 
They should have expected him, and so should we. These are just a few of more than 100 booklets that are available to you for free download online. So check them all out at ttb.org forward slash booklets. Now, as we take a quick break from our weekday study in Daniel this weekend, I invite you to join me for Through the Bible Sunday Sermon. This week, Dr. McGee's message is taken from Daniel chapter 9 and is titled, God's Calendar for Israel. To listen online or see if your local station carries the Sunday Sermon, visit us at ttb.org. God hates pride and shows us just how much through King Nebuchadnezzar. That's what Dr. McGee will explain on Monday as we continue our study of Daniel. I'm Steve Schwetz, as always, by the way, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus again next week. May God bless you as you seek Him in His Word. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole Word to the whole world.